Good evening. I'm Paul Fredette. And I'm Karen Fredette. And we'd like to thank you and for joining us once again as we continue our reflections <clears throat> on the life and times of Claire of Assisi, who was the first female follower and soulmate and close friend of St. Francis of Assisi. Men and women of the 13th century who not only were people of their times, way ahead of their times, but are also, we believe, people for our own times. Before Karen and I began our ministry, Ravensbread, to hermits and religious solitaries throughout the world some 17 years ago, Karen had been a member of the Poor Clares for over 30 years. And during that time, she spent better than 10 years yes. researching the life and the times of Claire of Assisi. And the fruit uh, of that research is providing us uh, during these weeks with the substance uh, for our reflections. Uh, those fruits were published as Claire, Her Light, and Her Song in 1984, and we have uh, reprinted them and brought them out again last year in 2012 in, uh, on the occasion of the 800th anniversary of the founding of the Poor Clares. If you've been following with us over the last couple of months to where we are at this point in the story, last week we spent some time paying uh, attention and reflecting on the significance of the changing relationships in the life of Claire and Francis, both in their own relationship, one with the other, as well as the relationships with the people that were closest to them. If you recall, we spoke about the effects of the death of Pope Innocent III, who had been a friend to both of them and was an ardent supporter, and he was the, the ecclesiastical person who really gave them their first start and uh, gave them permission to pursue their way of life and the preaching of the gospel. We also looked at the growing and changing relationships with Cardinal Ugolino, who had by now become appointed by Pope Honorius III as the Cardinal Protector of both the Friars and the Poor Ladies, the groups uh, of Friars Minor and Sisters Minor that were beginning to emerge in a much more structured way as orders, religious orders in the church. We looked at, uh, interestingly enough, the uh, now very changed relationship between Claire and her own natural sister Agnes, with whom she had grown up and w from whom she had hardly ever been separated before in her life, except for a bare two weeks when she first left home to uh, follow Francis before arriving at San Damiano. Ag her sister Agnes had been with her ever since, and now Francis had um, asked uh, Agnes to go and help found another monastery uh, a group of Benedictines who wanted to adopt the rule of the poor ladies, the way of life of the poor ladies, and so he sent Agnes. And this was a tremendously distressful thing for, uh, for Claire, who had never been separated from Agnes before. And there were a lot of anguished correspondence between the two of them. Also at this time, as we mentioned last week, Francis and Claire begin to separate somewhat. Francis's visits are less frequent, much less frequent to San Damiano, his personal visits. And in, uh, in his stead, he uh, delegates Brother Philip 
a happy choice, as it turns out, because Philip was one of the first brothers and uh, accompanied Francis, in fact, on those earliest clandestine meetings that he had with Claire as she was trying to discern a way of life and trying to come to grips with her own conversion and whether or not following the way that Francis was pointing towards was indeed for her. So Philip had been kind of in on that from the ground floor and now as Francis backed away from his uh, frequent presence at San Damiano. I don't know that it was ever really all that frequent, but at least it was fairly regular. And now he was pulling back from that, and Philip was pretty much taking the place of the visitator. And I think it's important to point out that the reason for Francis pulling away is that he wanted to give an example to the brothers. Mm -hmm. he, he was not um, unaware of what can happen. And he didn't want to give grounds for any um, undue relationship with the sisters. He and Claire, their friendship was above reproach, mm -hmm. but he wasn't, he knew human nature. Right. And the sisters uh, were very, very, the community was filled with love and compassion and affection. And it was a holy affection, but these were all young women. They were very young and several of them quite beautiful. Certainly Claire was a beautiful young woman. So Francis really wanted to set a tone and an example. And in fact, indicated that no one was to go and be, uh, uh, what was it, those who went and, and begged. A quester. A quester. Uh, they were not to volunteer for this. And uh, those who were chosen to go and have anything to do with the monastery at San Damiano were to be selected because of their unwillingness rather than because of their willingness and readiness to go and do that. And then finally, um, in 1219, Francis himself not only has stepped back but embarks on a voyage to the Holy Land on pilgrimage. He is going there trying to bring peace between the warring crusaders and the Saracens. And this is the occasion of his famous meeting with um, the Sultan, um, which we do have a, we do have a picture of here. And um, in fact, this, this is a rather, perhaps a, a kind of a modern rendition of this, but it sort of captures um, his his meeting with the Sultan in the Holy Land. But he doesn't come back until June of 1220, and throughout that year, uh, and and actually longer than a year, um, Francis left in the hopes that his pilgrimage would be cap, you know, would be somehow. Uh, the the apogee of this pilgrimage would be his own martyrdom. And so Claire was left in terms of a relationship wondering whether or not uh, that this would be, the, that she had seen Francis for the very last time in the flesh. Um, and so many of these relationships were changing. He does, however, survive the pilgrimage and he does return in June of 1220, but when Francis returns, he is a much changed man. He's changed in many ways. Um, physically, um, it, it's pretty well documented that in the Holy Land or around that area, he developed uh, an eye disease, which so severely affected his sight that he could not bear the light of mm. even brother's son and he would always have to wear his hood pulled over or a bandage over his eyes they were constantly running they were inflamed this was wearing on him he had some stomach problems before that and um, those were worsened 
by the experience of the Holy Land. So he came back much weakened, so weakened, in fact, that he couldn't walk easily and had to ride on a little donkey mm -hmm. to go from one friary to another. And when he gets back, he comes in on probably Venice, where the um, port would have been, and visits the friaries on the way back to um, Umbria and is very upset by what he begins to see. Things have changed dramatically, even in the year, and a year and a half or so that he was gone. He comes to the group of friars that were set up at Bologna, and many of them were studying at the university. And when they studied, they required books. Having books, they needed um, a dry, safe place to keep these precious volumes. And they had moved into a brick building. Well, when Francis saw this, he was so angry. Mm -hmm. He had no words. He simply got up on a ladder, apparently, and onto the roof of the building and started ripping the tiles off the roof. And when the friar said, the Holy Father, what are you doing? He said, my friars are not to live under a roof like this. They are poor men who are to live like the poor. And um, he, he and they said, well, we've got to protect these books. He said, well, then give those books back. You don't need them. My friars are not to be well-known scholars. You are to preach the gospel by your lives. And so he was running into one problem like this after another on his way back to Assisi. And in fact, he doesn't even go there. He goes instead to, to, Rome. to Rome to Cardinal Ugolino. And he says, my friend, I cannot deal with this. You must do something. You must help the brothers. It seems like my example is not enough for them. So he finally does, after speaking to Cardinal Ugolino, go back to Assisi. Mm -hmm. When he does go back to Assisi, if Claire had hoped at all, that he would now resume, especially since he was a bit more incapacitated and might not be traveling as much, that he would resume uh, frequent visits to San Damiano, she was disappointed. Even the friars, even the closest companions of Francis, wondered why he was keeping himself aloof. And Francis had to remind him when they brought it up to him that it was not for any lack of love of the sisters that he was doing this, but again, that he was giving them an example that as he did, so they had to do. Francis in his own way was shedding himself of responsibilities at this point. He knew that the order as it was, as he saw it right now, was not manageable by him. He was there to provide the inspiration, not the administration. Yes. And so he left off, in fact, resigned his position and gave it to Peter Catani. Friar Peter Catani was made the custodian, the minister of the society, of the, of the order. And <clears throat> even though Francis would have liked to have maintained that spiritual leadership, and in fact did, he wished that he could have maintained perhaps more control over the thing, but found that he just simply could not. And Claire very much shared the anguish. He was very torn inside by having to do this. He felt that somehow he had failed. He felt it was a weakness in him. He felt. Uh, you know, the recriminations, uh, the shattering of the dream, if you want, 
was he wondered what you know what his part what what was he doing wrong uh, because he could see that the friars were not living uh, the way that in following the example that he was trying to set for him for them and and this was his way of leading and and he said so repeatedly that his way of leading was to simply provide the example and and others would then know how they had to to do it well as a way of maybe trying to console francis in this time of real distress and anxiety and and a sense of of things crumbling apart uh, Claire had asked repeatedly if he wouldn't simply come and take a meal with her. And Francis had always refused. And finally, it had become such an issue that even his closest companions said to him, Francis, this does not even, this is not seemly even from the point of view of charity. Claire you know, deserves this consolation, this favor from you. And it just seems to us that your refusal is really unreasonable and bordering on a lack of charity. Well, Francis was forced to re-examine his whole position on this and finally reluctantly said that he admitted that he was accepting the counsel of his closest companions uh, including Brother Leo, and um, decided that, all right, very well, he would take a meal with Claire. However, he stipulated that, after reflecting on it, that Claire had been at San Damiano without leaving it ever since the start. Many, many years had gone by now. And so he said, the meal will take place, but it'll take place here at St. Mary of the Angels. And we'll invite Claire and a companion to come. To St. Mary's. And after all, a lot of things had changed. A lot of things had grown up. The last time that Claire had been to St. Mary of the Angels was when she herself had fled her parents' home and had come there to be received into Francis's way of life and his company. It was there where she knelt before the altar, had her hair shorn, and made her consecration of life to Christ. And after Arriving at San Damiano, she had never again, until now, visited St. Mary of the Angels. So the day finally arrived when she walked that dusty road, of perhaps a little over an hour's walk, back from San Damiano to St. Mary of the Angels, and visited around. No doubt the friars were anxious to show her all of the things that had developed and all that had grown up and about. And uh, we're quite certain she must have gone inside the chapel, inside St. Mary of the Angels, along with Francis, to pray before that same altar where she had initially made her consecration. But once she had revisited the place, they went back outside, and there on the grounds, on the lawn, Francis had spread a table for a meal together. And they all gathered around, the friars, Francis and Claire, Claire's companion, no doubt, who was with her. And they sat about, and as the meal was starting, Francis began to simply speak about God and about God's love and about the favors and graces of Jesus Christ in their lives. And he spoke so profoundly and so eloquently that the whole group gathered about as they sat on the ground before that meal, were just absolutely transported by his words. So much so that they forgot completely about the, the actual physical meal that was there. And they were so nourished by Francis's words uh, that they felt completely satisfied and really had no need, no need to really partake of the meal. Now, an interesting thing about the accounts of this event is that while this little group of friars and sisters who were together actually transported ecstatically by the words of Francis, the effect this was having on the countryside 
was that local farmers and country folk and villages looked about and saw such a bright glow emanating in the sky from the area about St. Mary of the Angels that the story goes they thought the place was on fire. Yes. And so they rushed from all directions in the countryside with buckets and with all kinds of things to, in, in hopes of putting out whatever fire was raging at St. Mary of the Angels, only to discover when they got there the scene of these friars and Sister Claire sitting together, Francis and Claire and the friars, and the light that illumined was just bright, bright light, but it was emanating from the group itself. They were so on fire with the love of God and God's love for them that uh, that this is what was causing uh, the light to light up the sky around St. Mary of the Angels. At the, um, after the meal, Claire went back to um, San Damiano, no doubt, very consoled. And as it turns out, the sisters at San Damiano were very consoled to see her come back <laughs> yes. because they had been concerned that Francis might have just sent her on to um, direct another monastery of the poor ladies, which at that point were growing up all over. Uh, in fact, Francis had said to Claire herself, um, hold yourself ready. It may be necessary for me to send you to one of the other monasteries as he had sent Agnes, her sister. And then, you know, what was happening is that initially the first groups of women to adopt or want to adopt Claire's life were those in the area and then further up and down the um, Italian peninsula. At this time, it is known that uh, a royal woman in France, Marie de Bray, wanted to found a community of poor ladies on her side of the Alps. And several sisters from San Damiano were sent there to um, start the community and to model it. And from there, wherever the friars went, they talked about the poor ladies and we saw communities springing up not only in France, in Spain, in as far away as Poland, Bavaria, um, Umbria, or not Umbria, but um, Czechoslovakia even. Mm -hmm. The Hungary. Um, Hungary, the sisters were being established everywhere. So the possibility of Claire not coming back was definitely a real one. Well, this did not happen. And neglected to show you as we were talking about the quote, the, the famous quote unquote picnic, we have this, this lovely uh, uh, illustration of Francis and Claire sitting together with the other friars and this holy glow and uh, in one end of the picture over here you see all of the villages uh, villagers that uh, have come out in the hopes of putting out this great fire only to find that it was the fire of the joy and uh, the the love of the Holy Spirit that was lighting up the gathering um, Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I missed I, that picture. I had neglected to <laughs> neglected to show you that picture. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but despite all of the growth, uh, the growth of the friars, um, the growth of the sisters in the sisters monasteries, and you know the joy that was ordinarily a part of the life of the monastery at San Damiano, Claire was not 
without, just like Francis at this time, severe, severe inner challenges. It seems that whenever there's that much joy, that much love, that much compassion, that much of the Spirit of God, it seems as though in, this, in those moments, the forces of darkness work harder to limit it, to find a way to thwart it, to squelch it. And as it turned out, Claire was no exception to this kind of dynamic. And in her own life, she was experiencing a great deal of inner turmoil that Thomas of Chilano describes in the ways of the Middle Ages as fighting with the devil. Well, she was, in fact, wrestling with her own inner demons. And they were the, the forces of doubt, the forces of uh, self-recrimination. Uh, they were the forces of uh, real vulnerability. Her love and her compassion were themselves the focus for the attacks of her own depression, her own anxiety, her own obsessive thoughts. Uh, it was as though the Dark One was looking for whatever chink, whatever little corner of self-reliance or, or that could or vanity or vanity that, woman. that could everybody's, bring down the whole edifice everybody's you know? gifts also are their weaknesses and so there was ample time for tears and ceaseless praying and sleepless nights and it wore on on uh, claire's health it really did it took its toll as much as maybe her fasting earlier uh, that her excessive fasting had done earlier. At any rate, she had her moments of genuine suffering, inner suffering, despite the overall growth and joy and actual success of the, the groups of poor ladies that were being formed. Um, we, um, I want to say something more about Brother Philip who was hmm. um, set up to be the protector for the poor ladies while Francis was gone. And his, um, he took his role very seriously. In fact, more seriously than Francis would have. And showed, because he wanted to protect the ladies. So he decided to obtain through Cardinal Ugolino a bull of excommunication from the Pope from the Pope for anybody who bothered the poor ladies in any way. Now this was using power and that idea of power was just totally contrary to Francis ideals. And when he heard about this he had Philip removed from the office immediately and had that bull um, rescinded. Rescinded. Cancelled. It was not to be that way. And um, proof that Franz Philip learned his lesson was that a few years later he was reappointed <laughs> to the same role, which he fulfilled for many years, very humbly, very ably. During this same time, one of the most important male figures of the period was Dominic Goodsman, whom we've mentioned. He was founding his own group of men, poor men, who were to also preach the Gospels by their lives, but particularly to argue with the heretics and to go into the schools where the heretics were, were teaching um, false doctrine. Francis and Dominic met, and possibly the first place they met was in the presence of Cardinal Hugolino, which this picture demonstrates. Mm -hmm. Paul happens to um, find this one of Cardinal Hugolino 
Would this have happened even before the Lateran Council? Because they, they, it, it, it sounded to me like they, I, I know they, it seems as though some of the stories seem to indicate they ran into one another at the Lateran Council. Well, that was a genuine possibility. But this meeting with Ugolino probably was after, mm -hmm. because at this point, both Francis and Dominic were working on the rules mm -hmm. for their, and they were deeply preoccupied with um, developing rules for their order. Francis was struggling to put down in words the ideal of his life. Dominic was not allowed, as Francis was, to have his own role as the basis for his community. Because the Lateran, Lateran Council had um, restricted any new rules, Dominic had to take the constitutions he had written for his brothers back to them. They had to choose one of the earlier rules, which in this case he chose the very simple flexible rule of St. Augustine as the basis for his constitutions and brought that back brought his constitutions back for approval and probably it was about this time as the three of them Francis, Dominic and Ugolino were talking about these things that Dominic Ugolino came up um, was looking at the both of them and Dominic had this brilliant insight he proposed to Francis he says brother Francis how about that your order and mine might be made one and that we might live in the church according to the same rule? Well, there was something to be said in favor of such a merger. They were both mendicants. They, they were, were both to make their, earn their keep by begging. Yes, they both um, embraced poverty for Dominic knew that his brothers would never impress the people they were preaching to if they came in rich clothing mm -hmm. and on um, horseback. So he, he and Francis had a lot in common. On the other hand, mm -hmm. Francis could see that there were definite differences between the two orders. Um, for Dominic's followers were concentrating on combating heretical trends by upholding truth through skillful and learned debates with the heretics. Francis's brothers were speak, speaking to the poor and the spiritually neglected people of the countryside. So they were both trying to preach the gospel, but their audiences were very, very different. And because their audiences were different, the tools they would need yes. would be very different. Most of the men who were joining Dominic were pr already priests. Right. Whereas, and, scholar, and some of them, many of them scholars as well. well yes, educated. you couldn't be a priest without no. being educated. And at the same time, the majority of Francis followers were laymen. You know, priests were rare mm. in the Franciscan group. So this was another significant difference among them. And Francis recognized that the both orders had something unique to offer the church, and it would be better if they each preserved their own identity. Even though stresses and strains were arising among Francis' brethren over the need for study and a university education, Francis actually had a very high regard for learned men mm -hmm. and welcomed them into his community. And we know this, we have one thing in writing. Some years, shortly actually before Francis died, one of his brothers wrote to him asking for permission to teach theology to the brothers. And Francis wrote back and he says, to, I am sending my good wishes of health to brother Anthony. Anthony, my bishop, he called him. And here we're talking about Anthony of Padua. It, it pleases me, Francis said, that you teach sacred theology to the brothers 
as long as, in the words of my rule, you do not extinguish the spirit of prayer and devotion, which this study should promote. Mm -hmm. So Francis was quite clear in his own mind about the priority to be fostered among his men. And that wasn't the, the other big priority was uh, an offer not made by Dominic, but an offer that came from Cardinal Ugolino to both Dominic and Francis, which Francis also decided against. And that was uh, the offer of accepting uh, prelacies. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Yes, um, Ugolino looked at these men who were truly models of, of, the, um, of Jesus, and he said, why not take bishops and prelates from among your order? Mm -hmm. Which he thought was a brilliant insight, and Francis was horrified by. <laughs> he said, um, my lord, my brothers are called minores, little ones, so they will not preserve to be, presume to become greater. Their vocation teaches them to remain in a lowly station and to follow the examples of the humble Christ, so that in the end they may attain the sanctity for which they are called. If, and Francis continued with the wisdom born of holiness, you want them to bear fruit for the church of God, hold them and preserve them in the station to which they have been called, and bring them back to it, even if they are unwilling. I pray you, therefore, Father, that you by no means permit them to rise to any prelacy, lest they become prouder rather than poorer. And Dominic, too, saw the dangers in such a proposal and turned it down. He said, preaching the word of God as a friar preacher was honor enough for his sons. The mendicant orders were not founded to supply the church with prelates, but to bring the glad tidings of the gospel to every person by living as nearly like Jesus as they could. Mm -hmm. Now, Francis wanted Dominic to meet his first and most beloved follower, and this was Sister Claire. It's likely that Dominic may have come to the chapter of 1221, where Francis was presenting the rule that he had labored over mm -hmm. for a long and heartbreaking time. Dominic came to that chapter and could see perhaps even better than Francis what was happening. He saw that there were this is a wonderful picture showing the love uh, between Francis and Dominic, and they are shown standing in front of the, a church which symbolized St. Mary of the Angels. And you can see that um, there's at least one Friar Minor and one Dominican standing behind their founders to show them as founders of orders. So Dominic comes to the chapter of 1221 where Francis presents his rule with a great deal of love and hope that his friars will read it, be inspired once again with the fire that they had felt in the beginning. There were a small group among the friars, however, who did not want the strictness of poverty, the strictness of lowliness that Francis insisted they be there in order to um, them to live most like Jesus, because they were to preach by example, not by words. And um, today there is a phrase that is 
passed around. You even see it on cups, which is from Francis himself, which simply said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. Mm -hmm. So Francis, is. it's likely, I and mean, this is a guess on my part, that at this time Francis took Dominic to meet Sister Claire because he knew Claire loved good preaching and Dominic certainly was an excellent preacher. But at the same time was Francis taking, was pleased to take Francis to, Dominic to meet Claire, he was going to San Damiano with a heavy heart. And I thought as I was reading through the sources, that possibly it was in the chapel of San Damiano that Francis had this experience. Certainly he needed it at this time. It was in something which, um, now I can't find the page, where it says, um, I found it. <laughs> Thomas of Chilano wrote it, and I like the way he wrote it. I want to share it with you that way. He wrote, For once, when Francis was disturbed and distressed, he gave himself over to prayer, as was his wont. He got this rebuke from his Lord, who said, Why are you disturbed, little man? Did I not place you over my order as its shepherd? And now do you not know that I will remain its chief protector? I have called, I will preserve and feed, and I will even choose others to repair the falling away of some. Do not be disturbed therefore, but work out your own salvation. For though the order might be reduced to only three members, it will, by my grace, remain. This tender assurance, says Chilano, assuaged all of Francis' anxieties. And from then on, he could say, with a conviction born of personal experience, that the deepest darkness can be dispersed by even a single ray of light. So Francis brought Dominic to meet Claire, the light. Mm -hmm. Perhaps at San Damiano, Francis also felt and the experienced the light of God's consolation. Dominic, however, was probably as disturbed and chagrined by the events of the chapter of 1221 because Francis's presentation of this finely developed rule that he had labored so long and had given so much of himself and his spirit into effort into writing this rule, which was not a very short, terse form of vitae like he had initially provided the brethren. This was a rather lengthy document that at times waxed poetic, it was extremely lyrical, just had all of the all of the effort and love and spirit that Francis could pour into this document, and he presented it very, very powerfully at the chapter. And there was a sense that everybody would be so moved by the power and the eloquence that it would be quickly adopted. At least that was what the opposition party felt. Feared, and, in fact. Yeah, and, and feared would happen. As it turned out, uh, what happened at the chapter was that Cardinal Ugolino, the Cardinal Protector, was unable to preside, was unable to be there, and another prelate was sent to preside. Well, in the presentations and in the back and forth, the opposition party uh, saw its opportunity in the absence of Cardinal Ugolino to argue that 
certain parts of the rule were too repetitious and certain parts of the rule were too lengthy and certain parts of the rule did not have the were not couched in the appropriate legal terminology and so the whole matter of putting it to a vote which they feared should really be deferred well as it turns out it looks as though francis even himself was relieved that it was deferred and probably saw the good sense in it feeling that or believing at least at the time that cardinal ugolino would help him to to preserve the integrity of this rule and yet make it acceptable to everybody now the opposition party that group that really wanted to change the way of life and mitigate the of the extent the form of poverty the level of poverty that they were living they in their own way uh were glad that it was being deferred because they felt that cardinal ugolino was the only person who could prevail upon francis to accept what they mandated as needed changes to the rule at any rate the rule was submitted it was not brought up for a vote, but it was submitted to Brother Elias. And no one knows what happened to it. It disappeared. At but least temporarily. It was not found during Francis' lifetime. The rule would have to be rewritten. They never really got a chance to vote on the rule of 1221. However, in 1221, the first rule really was by 1221, not in 1221, but by 1221, Francis's, what really is Francis's first rule, which may have originally been published as a letter to the faithful, which in history has come to be known as the rule for the third order was the way of life that he had presented when he had been met with such an overwhelmingly positive and enthusiastic response by the people of the towns and the villages and the countryside where he preached. He enjoyed a tremendous amount of success and was met with people who wanted to adopt and to follow as much of his way of life as they could. They wanted to follow the gospel but they couldn't leave their homes or families and so francis did compose a short rule or what as i said what has come to be known as a third order rule and this was approved by the pope and this was really in one sense the first rule of the franciscans really to be approved real formal rule to be approved was it? I, I'm not sure about approval at that point. Mm -hmm. all, all we know is that um, it was sanctioned. It, it was sanctioned and it has come down through the centuries. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, Francis was always using the Gospels and the text of the Gospels. And that's what you will find in this um, letter to the faithful, which makes many people believe that's probably the first redaction mm -hmm. of the um, way of life that Francis offered to the men and women who remained in the, in secular circumstances. But they too had a right to follow the gospel as fully as they could. He saved his most powerful sermon though for his own beloved Claire and her he, sisters. He did. And that that is a most moving story which we'd love to share with you it may well have taken place around this same time but um again francis was being urged to um visit the sisters because they had they had um need of his, spiritual. Need of his spiritual guidance and francis recognized that he did owe them that but he had held back, and there were many reasons, and some of them very personal, that he didn't go to them right away. When he got there, the sisters all assembled. They were behind a grate by this time. 
but they could see him clearly. And they not only wanted to hear him, but they wanted to see their father Francis again. Claire would have been among them. And they watched and waited. And Francis simply stood there. Um, finally, his eyes cast up to heaven. He just prayed deeply. And then he said, can you bring me a bucket of ashes? Well, anything Father wanted, Father would get. So the sisters brought him the ashes. He took them and he carefully, ceremoniously, as it were, ritually, sprinkled them in a circle around him and what was left over he poured over his head and he stood there silently for a few minutes more and then he began to recite the psalm that we know as the miserere have mercy on me o god in your goodness in the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. And he went on in that vein, praying this beautiful psalm for forgiveness, covered by ashes, which were the sign, a symbol of penitence in his day. And then he left. He said nothing more. It said that the sisters were in tears when they realized, and the profound symbolism was certainly not lost on Claire. For she intuited that this message of Francis was that he was only able to preach, not by words, but by symbolic action. But Claire also knew that however unworthy he felt, the purifying work of the Spirit was going on within him and may have been the main cause for that misery. And she remembered that banked coals, banked by the ashes, often give off the most intense heat. And that when the kindling, the right kindling is brought near, the flames leap up again to greater heights. Because so much of what we've reflected on and discussed here um, in this hour has to do with the inner anguish and turmoil that both Francis and Claire experienced. Um, <clears throat> we thought that what might be appropriate as a, as a kind of a meditative prayer uh, would be something which would focus us all on the crucified Lord because there's no doubt that Claire and Francis were so joined to the crucified Jesus that they were experiencing their own crucifixions at this time and so what song did we select Karen? Um, we, we chose a song that is based on the words that Claire wrote to Agnes of Prague it's in one of the letters, and the um, where the words were sent to music by an Irish poor Claire, Sister Brige O'Hare, and it is sung for us by a Sister Marie Cox, and it is called Look, Look on Jesus, and I'm sure it's an insight into the um, mind and heart and soul of both Claire and Francis. We have the words of the text available for you so that you can follow it as you hear it. So sit back, relax for a moment, perhaps breathe deeply, just let go and attempt to focus in the here and now and listen to these words which are 
some of the most beautiful words that Claire ever penned. We want to thank you again for joining with us this evening. We want to especially uh, express our gratitude for the wonderful invitation that we received last March from Brother Sean Bradley to participate in the efforts of the interfaith Franciscan community uh, through these presentations on the Doves for Peace channel. Karen and I would not only thank you, but want to offer you our prayers and invoke as we end this broadcast this evening with the... I, we also want to let you know that if you're interested in knowing about Claire fully, the, the book that we're using is available on our website, um, ravensbreadministries.com. The book is available there. And you can buy it from, directly from us, and you'll even get an autographed copy if you're so inclined. So as always, we want to conclude by invoking God's blessings on us all, you included, in the words of Claire herself. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to you and be merciful to you. 
May the Lord turn his countenance to you and give you peace. May the Lord be with you always. And wherever you are, may you be with him always. Thank you for joining us this evening. We wish you God's peace and God's blessings. God be with you. Good night.